It's a pleasure to be here again. I think the first presentation I gave four years ago was in this room. Uh, so it's nice to be back. Uh, just a little background, I'm, a, I'm trained in internal medicine. I worked in academic medicine for 20 years. I taught, tried to teach nutrition to doctors. Uh, so my background is internal medicine, but I did a PhD in nutritional biochemistry, and I had this idealistic idea in the 1980s that doc, we, we could teach nutrition to doctors and doctors could use that to treat their patients. So well, that didn't go real well, and I finally gave up 20 years ago and moved into uh, independent consulting and then uh, trying a few startups. Um, uh, so just leave it at that. I enjoy teaching, but I don't enjoy being forced to teach things that I don't believe are true. So I'm going to show you things that are heretical. As Dr. Taylor said, I'm going to give two talks. The second one's going to be about using carbohydrate-restricted dieting to um, improve the well-being and function of people with type 2 diabetes. Now, that makes a sense because if your blood sugar is really high, you know, if you take away at least some of the carbs, the blood sugar would come down. So you think, yeah, that makes sense. But for athletes, if you take away their carbohydrates, you know, we've been told that the fuel you need for high-performance athletics is carbohydrate. And we're basically taking away, you know, cutting off their fuel supply and then asking them to do, do things. Uh, and so this is the more challenging topic of the two. By the way, I'm going to try to get through 140 years of research and human experience in about the next 28 minutes. Uh, I do, we will have time for questions afterwards, but I'm going to kind of cruise through the slides pretty quickly. Uh, and I apologize for that, but I, uh, I can't give you half the story. So if that works. Um, when I started out, with my interest, and I had a kind of a perverse interest initially. I, being an endurance bicyclist, not competitive, but just, you know, my, one of my interests is riding bicycles long distances. And I realized early on I had to eat carbs or I was going to experience what you call hitting the wall. You run out of fuel, you feel terrible, and you, you know, we didn't have Uber, you, or you, Uber back then. You couldn't call someone and take you home. And walking home 30 or 40 miles is always unpleasant. Um, so, but I was interested in how people living in, Aboriginal people living in hostile environments like the Inuit who lived in the Arctic, where there was, for at least eight to ten months a year, there was no source of gatherable dietary carbohydrates. You know, how did they get by? And so this is a photograph that came from a book from, by an anthropologist who explored the Arctic and, and uh, had a sympathetic approach to understanding these people's culture. And so they took this picture around 1910 of these two women and a guy behind them on the Arctic tundra. This is in their summer. You can see there's lots of berries and fruit there on the ground. Uh, you know, it was quite a hostile environment even in the summer, but they spent at least eight months a year living on ice and snow. And their predominant source of clothing, you can see from what they're wearing, um, uh, you know, their animal skins, their bedding are caribou skins, uh, and their diet consisted of meat and fat. Uh, and it, it could be meat from animals, it could be meat from uh, ocean-going mammals, it could be meat from fish, but these people lived on basically a carnivorous diet. And uh, the, my question here is, what can we learn from modern Stone Age people? You know, you've all heard of the paleo diet, but you know, we believe paleolithic peoples ate before there was any agriculture. And we study what's on the, the floor of a cave where they, they lived for generations and try to piece through from the stuff on the cave what they ate. But these people, there were you know, literate people interacting with them, and they knew how to construct from the foods available to them something that would allow them to live and function, live a physically challenging life. But they were not illiterate people. They didn't write it down. So there was, was no food guide for you know, uh, dietary guidelines for the, you know, the Inuit culture. Um, uh, but uh, I will show you a little bit about people who lived among them and, and uh, tried to understand what they ate and why they ate it and how they functioned. So this is a um, painting from a diary of a, an Arctic explorer named Frederick Swatka. He was a U.S. Army surgeon back in the days when surgeons stemmed, as we all know, from barbers, not from you know, the learned medical side. But Dr. Swatka decided that he was, in, in the United States we call it the surgeon's doctor, that he decided that they would, he wanted to go into the Arctic and try to figure out what happened to a Royal Navy expedition that was trying to find the Northwest Passage that sailed into the Arctic in 1843. The last word of them was from 1845 and then they completely disappeared. And no one knew what happened to them. In the late 1870s, he 
went up into the Arctic, recruited two Inuit families, and decided that he was going to try to travel up to the uh, coast of the Arctic Ocean and see if he could figure out what happened to these ships and men. 129 men, two ships. And so he uh, took this overland trek that took uh, uh, the better part of two years, traveled 3,000 miles on foot, and they lived off the land from the fruits of the hunting of these two Inuit families. Uh, and they made the full journey. Uh, and uh, it, it, the, the good news is they found uh, evidence of where these ships had come to grief, where the sailors had gone ashore. They found skeletons. They found graves. They found abandoned boats and materials. But they didn't find any written records of how this, this group came to grief. Um, but he kept this diary. It was published in, in, a, in an obscure um, uh, um, uh, by an obscure, obscure publishing house, and I happened to stumble upon a copy. Um, and the fascinating thing is this quote here. It says, when first thrown wholly upon a diet of reindeer meat, by which he means caribou, it seems inadequate to nourish the system, and there is an apparent weakness uh, to perform severe exertive journeys, for, you know, which means you, you, know, you couldn't exercise very well when you were started on this diet. But this soon passes away in the course of two to three weeks. Well, I discovered this when I was completing my PhD dissertation, and I'd been studying a group of bike racers, and we looked at how long it took them, if they could, how long would it take them to adapt to a low-carb diet. And it turned out to be at least two or three weeks. And I, my this dissertation was published, or presented and defended in 1980. And I have to say humbly, this guy scooped me by a century. But here's this is an important thing. When you switch from a diet that is rich in carbohydrate to a diet that's low in carbohydrate, the human body does not make that transition in a day or two or three or one week. And yet, as I will show you, the modern academic research in human, uh, comparing human high carb to low carb diets, most of that research uh, involves studies done for lasting any one, one to three weeks. So they completely ignored the learnings from back at this time and my harping about this at, uh, for the last 40 years. Um, but the problem was that Swatka didn't write down what the people ate um, in, in terms of specific amounts, like how many grams of protein, how much fat, how much did they have sources of carbohydrate, that kind of thing. However, this gentleman, a, a, uh, a gentleman of uh, Icelandic parentage, born in Canada, uh, who went to Harvard to, to study anthropology, and he had this fascination with the Inuit peoples. And so he devoted about 12 years of his life to living in the Arctic. He learned their language. He lived among them. There was one time when he was away from any contact with, you know, uh, European uh, 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 settlements. So he was out among the native peoples for a full two years. His... his um, uh, obituary was published in the New York Times, and they came walking back, Hale and Hardy, and said, oh yeah, we traveled up uh, over the ice into, the, into these islands. We discovered a bunch of new islands in the Arctic Ocean. And he said, oh, by the way, I didn't eat any vegetables or fruit for, for two whole years, and see, I'm healthy. And of course, they knew he was a liar, because in the same time frame, uh, in the, the uh, late 19-teens and into the early 1920s, that's when all the vitamins were discovered, including vitamin C. And we knew if people were deprived of vitamin C, they'd get scurvy. And within four to six months of developing scurvy, you die. And this guy didn't. And so they knew he was lying. He had to be holed up somewhere, eating frozen orange juice or something. <laughs> no, kidding. But he so scandalized the nascent nutrition community that he was called a liar, not just in the lay press, but in the scientific literature. And to salvage his reputation, he allowed himself to basically be locked up in a research ward. And it turned out it was in an insane, insane hospital in, you know, in New York City called Bellevue Hospital. And he ate nothing but meat and fat for a whole year. And the intention was to make him get sick and prove he was wrong. And he didn't get sick. He remained hale and hearty, he held his weight stable, and he lived on basically a diet of meat and fat. And there, the scientists, to their credit, wrote down precisely how, how much meat, how much fat, what he ate every day. And we have that record. It was published in a very reputable journal in 1930 called the Journal of Bio Biological Chemistry. And um, I mean, this is really scary. He ate 115 grams of protein, which is about 15, up to maybe 20% of his daily energy need. Um, so it wasn't a high protein diet. This is what most of us in developed countries uh, eat in terms of the proportion of protein in our diet. He ate over 200 grams of fat per day and that represented as much as 
of his daily energy need came coming from fat. And the only carbohydrate that he got in his diet, because he ate no fruit and vegetables at all, came from the carbohydrate that we, we animals store in our muscles is something called glycogen, which is a, a, a form of, of available carbohydrate that we store in our liver and our muscles. Uh, and so he was getting less than 10 grams of carbs per day uh, and did it for a whole year. And it came from a variety of sources. Um, so meat, fish, poultry, fat, it was boiled. If they boiled the meat, they consumed the broth. And in retrospect, that makes a whole lot of sense. And, and I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later. Uh, but he also ate organ meats. You know, as some people you know, who advocate a, you know, a sustainable approach to this sort of thing, you eat the animal nose to tail. Uh, but they ate the fat-rich sources in the animal, not the lean, uh, because they needed that fat intake to, to maintain what he'd learned from the Inuit for that diet. Um, uh, and so this you know, was published in 1930. And uh, literally, when I was doing my research for my dissertation in the late 1970s and looked at how many people had cited this paper published in 1930 in a highly reputable journal, it was almost zero. It would be completely ignored. I don't want to be too crude, but it was kind of like people walking down the sidewalk and walking around a little bit of dog poop, as opposed to recognizing that it was there. Uh, it was completely ignored. Roughly in the same time frame, um, a group of well-recognized researchers in Denmark were studying how different amounts of carbohydrate in the diet affected, affected physical performance. And these were two established researchers, Dr. Uh, Christensen and, and Hansen. Um, and this is being before the World War II, it was published in German in a, in a Scandinavian journal, but in the German language. And the, this term here, Arbeitsfähigkeit und Ernährung, means work performance and nutrition. So this is a study of work performance and nutrition. And what they did was they fed people either a diet high in carbohydrate, normal con content of carbohydrate, or high in fat. Um, and the example of their high fat diet, notice is very different than what Stefansson uh, Eight, their protein was 21 grams, 45 grams of carbohydrate, and 576 grams of fat. This was, they were feeding this, 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 these subjects 5,000 calories a day. Many, many more calories than they need, but they, you know, they say, well, let's feed them a really high fat diet and see what happens. And this, I don't know if you can read the German, you know, it's made it tomatoes with mayonnaise and rhubarb with cream and um, uh, cauliflower with butter. Uh, speck is, is um, a bacon, uh, and if you look at the amount of bacon that they fed them, almost half a pound of bacon containing 189 grams of fat. I mean, it was kind of an extremely high fat diet versus a normal intake versus a high carbohydrate diet. Uh, and they tried it for just one day, and then they realized that uh, uh, they tried for three days, and people didn't seem to be adapting. So they, ex they pushed it, and they extended their adaptation period out to a total of seven days. And when they did that, and they looked at their performance time, if you look here at, on this graph, uh, this on the bottom, this is from 0 to 240 minutes. This is four hours. And this is endurance time on the high-fat diet, and they go about 90, less than 90 minutes. On the normal diet, they went out to 120 minutes. On the high-carbohydrate diet, look at this. It went out to four hours. They said, see, a high-carbohydrate diet is absolutely necessary for physical performance. Now, this was published in German in 1939, so guess what happened to it? Yeah. It was ignored. But a group of Swedish scientists in, in the 1960s picked up this, Jonas, Bergman, or, uh, Jonas Bergman, Holtman, and Saltine. I can't remember all their first names exactly. And they were the people who developed this concept of carbohydrate loading is absolutely necessary for endurance sport. They developed a needle that kind of looked like this, the size of this pen here, and they make a little incision, stick it in your thigh, take out a piece of muscle, measure the amount of glycogen. They showed that the amount of glycogen in the muscle was directly correlated with your ability to do physical performance. By the way, I know about how that biopsy is done because I learned how to do them by watching two of them being done on my thigh. Um, things we do to, for science. Um, but this data was then replicated by the Swedes in studies lasting up to mostly only one a week. And the longest study they ran it for, of any of their studies was two weeks. And they corroborated the fact that, that the, the best performance is when it results in the highest muscle glycogen content, which is stored carbohydrate. And so the highest carbohydrate uh, in the muscle correlated with the best performance. And it became the standard knowledge and is still taught to graduate students, undergraduate and graduate students, 
around the world in exercise physiology. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, that's the old history. Uh, I again became convinced I sh we should study this in people because although my experience in doing endurance sport was I needed carbs starting in the first hour, I'd hit the wall and I'd feel terrible and couldn't function. And so, but I had some patients who'd gone on this thing called the Atkins diet when it first came out in the mid 1970s and they said, oh, I feel fine. And I, and I said, it can't be true. So we decided we would put people on a relatively extreme low carbohydrate diet um, made up of, of meat, fish, and poultry providing only 600 calories per day but the neat thing is when you put somebody on a diet like that, they lose a lot of weight. So we got them to agree to be locked up in a metabolic research ward, basically a diet prison, fed them 600 calories a day for a total of six weeks, and we measured their performance at baseline before we started this extreme virtually carbohydrate devoid diet. Then after one week on the carb-restricted diet to, to mimic what the, the Scandinavians had done, and then and stupid me, we carried it out to six weeks. And I'll tell you, if I'd just done the first week or two and then published that data, my career path would have been very different than it was. So, by the way, during, while they were doing this, uh, we had them do no, no training. The only exercise they got was when we put them on the treadmill and asked them to go as long as they could on the treadmill. So they did not get better because of training. Uh, and then the other thing is the average person lost about uh, uh, 12 kilograms. Uh, and because it's not fair to have them walk uphill on a treadmill and having lost 12 kilograms, we put a backpack on them, as you see here, and we had them put in heavy objects in the backpack so they weighed the same on the treadmill as they did at the start. So we were really mean to them. And they hated carrying this backpack because these weren't people who went out hiking and, you know, with a rucksack. These were, you know, people who generally weren't very physically active. Um, but they did their best effort. And this graph here, I don't, don't know how well this shows up in the brighter lights, but their baseline, at baseline, their time to exhaustion was about a little less than three hours. Remember that normal diet people went about two and a half hours in that Scandinavian study. One week into the ketogenic, they did, they're down to 120 minutes. So again, there was less, as the same as Christensen and Hansen showed in their 1939 paper, which, which by the way is a highly quoted paper. But six weeks later, carrying the backpack, look, at, they went 240. This looks like it was the high carb diet. A couple flies in the ointment. They lost about 25 pounds, 12 kilograms. Um, and we had them carrying the backpack, but their, the oxygen cost, the actual work to, to walk them to do the same work on the treadmill was less. There was about a 5% decrease in the energy cost, which would have made this recovery here a little bit more accentuated. I don't think it would fully explain this here, but we got criticism from that. The other thing that in order to do this, I mentioned that, that uh, when Stefanson was locked up in the, the, uh, the hospital and, and ate just meat and fat and they boiled the meat, they added salt to the water. And when they, cooked it, when they finished cooking it, they drank the broth. And when you cook meat and you add salt to the water, you're getting a source of salt, which is important for your circulation. But also, you, when you boil meat, you lose the potassium into the broth. And potassium is absolutely important for maintaining muscle function and heart function. Um, and so again, one of the, the, uh, the danger points of doing a ketogenic diet is you know, eating the protein but not getting the minerals. And you know, this came from aboriginal learnings that, that you had to have the minerals as well as the protein if you wanted to be able to maintain physiological function. So we published this. It caused a considerable degree of outrage. Uh, and one of the criticisms was these people weren't, weren't high-quality high athletes. They didn't know what exhaustion was. You know, they thought I was some sort of you know, profit or something, and they'd go longer for me just because they wanted to please me or something. Uh, so we were told that this really wasn't a, 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 a rigorous scientific study. Uh, so that's what convinced me to go back to school. I'd already finished my medical training. I went back and got my PhD. And my dissertation research was I got a group of lean bicycle racers. And you can see all the bandages here because we were drawing blood. We took that needle and took hunks of muscle out of their leg. Uh, we were running IV. Um, uh, uh, tracer uh, stable isotopes into them and measure their, their metabolism of energy and so on. The longest I was allowed to, to use the metabolic research ward, because that's very expensive, was they said you can put five people in it for four weeks and that's it. That's all you get. And so we did a four-week study hoping that four weeks was long enough to see the adaptation 
that we figured from the previous study we used. And this time, we fed them a diet that held their weight stable. But it was patterned after the Stefanson diet. Um, and this is, a, sorry for the data here. I'll just try to explain. This top line here called VO2 max, this is a measure of their body's ability to make to, to uptake and use oxygen for fuel at the, at, you know, for burning fuel at the maximum rate. Five liters per minute at baseline, after four weeks of eating no carbohydrates, their peak aerobic power, which is what this is, was 5.0. These are not statistically significant, 5.1 versus 5.0. So they pre preserved the function of their muscles, their heart, their lungs, all the systems necessary to take oxygen in the body, burn it for energy, and, and do this work. Their endurance time to exhaustion, remember, they went up a whole, a whole lot with the, the overweight patients who lost a lot of weight. They went from 147 to 151 minutes, but this was not significant. This was not a significant increase. But this thing called RER here, which is a measure of the ratio of oxygen consumption to CO2 production, which tells you how much carbs and fat they're burning, this 0.83 indicates they're burning about half carbs, half fat. This 0.72 here means they're burning almost all fat. This is a heretical number, that the human body could do vigorous activity. By the way, this, this endurance time to exhaustion, their energy use translated to 920 calories per hour. That was the intensity at which they were exercising. So this is not modest exercise. And look at the, the rate at which they, they're burning fat. And then the muscle glycogen here, we'll come back to this in a couple more slides, because this is going to be really important for the talk is they started out with 143, quote, units, of, if you will, of glycogen in their muscle. And after this you know, two and a half hours of exercise, they dropped that down by more than half to, to 56. Once they were adapted, to, remember, they're eating no carbohydrate, and yet at the end of four weeks, they still had 76 units of glycogen muscle. They did the same amount of endurance exercise, and they used glycogen at, at less than a third the rate which means that you can do the same amount of work with a lot less glycogen use once you go through this process that we named keto adaptation. So we published this paper in uh, a, a good journal in 1983, and that's when my, most of my research on diet and performance ended because I couldn't get any more funding to do that kind of research. I was told, Steve, you need to work on something else. This is, this is not important stuff to do. Anyway, I, I tried some other things. So, when Dr. Taylor mentioned that I've written two books, the art and science books, um, he didn't mention that the first author in both those books is someone named Dr. Jeff Volick. And Jeff is a registered dietitian with a PhD in exercise physiology. He's a professor at the Ohio State University. Uh, and he's the first author because if Jeff hadn't come to me in the early 2000s and said, Steve, you got to get back into this because I pretty much given up. He picked me up, you know, whacked me on the side of the head, dusted me off, and said, get back into this. And he went and looked at my, my research from published on the bike racer study. He said, well, let's look at those performance data, because it went from 147 to 151. But look at the five different subjects. This one was about flat. So from the before to after the adaptation, there was almost no change in their endurance time to exhaustion. Two of them went down really steeply. One went up and one went up dramatically. And you say, well, maybe people differ from one from another. And maybe because this is only a four-week study, that these people adapted, the ones who were flatter going up, adapted a little quicker. And these guys needed longer to adapt, but we didn't give enough time. So again, you go back and look at data, and sometimes you say, wow, you know, I missed that. So I, I missed that for 20 years until Volek came along. Uh, and so, you know. He should be up here giving the talk, but he's too busy with his work at Ohio State. So how long does it take for a human to adapt? What is the right time? And this is kind of technical for those of you who don't have medical backgrounds, but there is a waste product that builds up in our blood called uric acid. If you are genetically predisposed to gout and it builds up too high, you get gout. So it can do damage to that small percentage of people who are gout prone. So this is associated with gout. The whole Goal of the, one of the many goals of the kidney is to get this out of the body. When you start someone on a ketogenic diet, this stuff that we think of as pretty dangerous stuff doubles. So you can see it goes from like six units up here to over 12. And in the first two weeks, it goes up and stays up. And then very slowly, it starts coming back down. And it's not coming back down because the body's making less of it. 
it appears to be coming back down because the kidneys are adapting to get rid of the stuff because it's these things called ketones when you go on a very low carb diet get in the way of its excretion initially and it, it sort of acts like coffee grounds in your in your sink drain you know it kind of blocks it up for a while until the body figures out how to deal with that but the adaptation time for kidney dealing with uric acid is um, uh, looks to be about 10 to 12 weeks and that's what athletes who started using this diet are telling us that you know this isn't something where they get they, you know they feel they go through this really low phase for the first, first couple of weeks then they feel pretty okay but they really don't get back to their full uh, uh, stable capability till they've been on it for a number of number of months not a number of weeks so uh, if you, will, you read studies where people do two, three week long studies, or even a four week study, it's really not a valid test of how humans adapt to this. But then this raises one of the barriers to this, to this kind of approach to performance. And that is, you know, you can't just do this for a week and then go out and win races. You know, this is something you've got to make a commitment to doing this for a long period of time if you think there are advantages to doing this. Are there advantages to doing this? Well, this is, these are two photographs of, uh, subjects from studies that Jeff did, and I got to be a fly on the wall, uh, you know, from a distance. He's in Ohio, I'm in California. But uh, uh, Captain John Rutherford here, who's sitting in the cockpit of his F-18, he's a Marine fighter pilot, um, is a ultra-endurance athlete. He's done a uh, 100-mile uh, run through the mountains of California called the Western States Endurance Run. I think he's the first person to complete that run in under 20 hours on a low-carb diet. Um, and the advantage is that if you're running 100 miles, you have to eat carbs from the start. 6,000 calories of carbohydrates while you're running if you want to get to the finish line because you can't store enough glycogen in your body to go that distance. You have to eat your way to the finish line. If you're adapted to a ketogenic diet and you're burning mostly fat, even a really skinny runner, like this guy here, uh, Sergeant Mike Morton in the U.S. Army, um, you know, you can see this guy doesn't have an ounce of fat on him. Actually, he's got 25,000 calories of fat in his body. He's gotten enough to, to run 250 miles if he was able, running just purely on fat. So he does, I don't think he's ever run 250 miles, but uh, Sergeant Morton did set the U.S. record for running distance run in 24 hours, which is 172 miles. And he didn't have to be eating carbohydrates to do that. So it liberates ultra-endurance athletes from having to eat and run or eat and perform because you're running on the much bigger fat fuel tank that even skinny people have in the body compared to the amount of glycogen we store in our body. So to, and these people started adopting this before we started doing rigorous science on these highly performance athletes. So Jeff Bolick, who I give a huge amount of credit to, said, let's get a bunch of them into the lab and study them. So he did this study he called the FASTER study, Fat Adapted Substrates in Trained Elite. You know, it's, he's great at acronyms. Uh, so basically what he did was he recruited 10 ultra runners, people who run you know, 100 kilometer, 100 mile races. He recruited 10 of them who were still following a very high carbohydrate diet. And these were you know, top ranked ultra runners. But he also recruited 10 like Dr. Ruth or for John Rutherford, Captain Rutherford, uh, who had voluntarily switched to a ketogenic diet and had been following it for at least six months and the average was close to two years. And he brought them into the lab. Uh, and by the way, he and his students very carefully matched these two groups for age. So 33, 34, height similar, body mass, weight. Uh, uh, and very important, their peak aerobic power, VO2 max, uh, which is um, the second from the bottom here, uh, in mils per kilo is 64 versus 64. So they're matched for weight, fitness, all these parameters. The only difference was this group on the right-hand side was eating a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet, and this group was following a high-carb diet. This shows you the difference. This group was eating 10% carbs, the low-carb diet. This group was eating 60. So the difference is you could tell from what there was on their plates which group they were in. This was, you can't blind a study like this. But they were very well-matched groups. And one of the things they did was they put them on a treadmill and had them run for three hours at their typical race pace on the treadmill. So in this top picture here, you can see this guy with the red shirt. This happens to be Captain Rutherford. You know, when he's not following a fighter jet, he's running on a treadmill, a marathon distance, staring at a blank wall. I mean, 
talk about uh, masochistic behavior. I mean, this, <laughs> this is, um, they had a muscle, but you can see the size of the needle here going in this guy's leg, taking on a piece of muscle, so we measured glycogen and other things, drew blood samples and monitored them. Um, and so they, they did this test, testing on these uh, uh, 20 guys. Uh, and what did they find? Well, the first thing is, were the guys who said they were eating a ketogenic diet, were they really in ketosis? And I was in my second slide, or second talk later, I'm going to show you the, uh, our definition, but we've arbitrarily defined a 600 value here as being the threshold for ketosis. And these guys were, you know, before they started on the treadmill, they were clearly in ketosis. The ones who were eating a high-carb diet were not, so very different. When they did the three hours of exercise, exercise stimulates the body's oxidation of fat. So both groups went up, but the low-carb runners never got their ketones anywhere near the values for the high-carb runners. And then this is what happens after exercise. But they're clearly very different in terms of the amount of this fuel, the ketones in the bloodstream. So A, this is a diet people can follow when they're really motivated. And the reason that they are the high-fat, low-carb diet people are motivated to do it is it liberates them from having to eat a lot of carbs, which for ultra runners, for many of them, causes a major gastrointestinal upset while they're trying to do the event. Uh, and so it liberates them from this dependency on having to eat lots of sugar and syrupy things and things like that. Um, the rate of fat oxidation, if you measure it as you increase the intensity of exercise from very low up to maximum, this curve here of the high carb runners, it fits everything that you see, find in exercise physiology textbooks. And that is, as you start exercising at low intensity, you go from walking to maybe a jogging pace, you increase your fat oxidation. But once you get past a jog and get the higher intensities, your ability to burn fat drops off, but your need for energy keeps going up. And so you become highly dependent on carbs for fuel. And this stuff is called glycogen in the muscles, wherein with the guys who are keto adapted, remember they've been on this for a minimum of six months, the average I think was 20 months, and they were burning fat at a much higher, you know, more than double the rate, but more importantly, when they got out here to the higher intensities, 70 or 80 percent of their max, they were getting most of their calories from fat. And this is completely different than anything you'll still find in the mainstream textbooks. But this is, we published this in 19, or 2016 uh, and presented it many times. But again, it takes a long time to change the dogma. But there's the data. This is the actual rate of fat oxidation for each of the, the individuals. And you can see the blue on the bottom here are the high carb runners. And their maximum rate in grams of fat burned per minute was point, the average was 0.67. The highest one was here. The lowest of the high fat keto adapted runners was double this value. And there were these two, and then this group up here, they're, they're, it's a completely different world in terms of fat oxidation. And the dynamics over the three hours of running is that the high carb runners started out at about 50-50, but the most they could get um, their carbohydrate oxidation down to was about 40%, whereas the keto adapted runners started just a little above 10% and stayed constant. It was a completely different fueling strategy for the body. And then going back to this slide, this is the glycogen levels. Remember, my bike racer's glycogen was cut in half after four weeks, and they used much less of it. But to our absolute surprise, when we looked at the glycogen levels for the high carb and the low carb runners at baseline, it was no different, and their use was exactly the same. Now, in this, the slide I just showed you, the use of the net use of carbohydrate is very low, and yet their glycogen was going away. And then two hours after they stopped the exercise, when we did another biopsy, most of the glycogen had come back in the low-carb runners, which means it wasn't burned. It was picked up by other organs in the body, held on until the exercise was done, and then it gave it back to the muscles. It wasn't being terminally used. It was being recycled. So it's like, you know, a lot of the metal that we, the chairs are made out of here were probably, you know, World War II cruisers that we didn't need after the, you know, after the war was won kind of thing. We recycle metal and basically the keto adapted runners are recycling the stuff that is used to keep critical fuels like glycogen in the body, but it's not being burned as fuel, it's being basically recycled over and over. And that the pattern of use shown here in this slide on the right hand side, for each individual, the patterns were almost indistinguishable, which says that it takes many 
months for the body to go through this adaptation process. Um, in the interest of time, we got started a little slow. I'm not going to bore you with lipoproteins like cholesterol and saturated fats and things like that, because I'm going to cover that in my second talk on, on the people with diabetes. Just finally, I want to tell you that what's the utility of this for people who aren't crazy enough to try to want to run 100 miles? Well, one of our the, the, the concerns for the national security in the United States is that the majority of our youth aren't fit to, to join the military. And many of the people who join the military in the course of, of uh, their, their time in the military uh, experience what many of us do. And you know, Dr. Taylor mentioned he lost a, a few kilos from his waist. I lost quite a few more than that you know, in my 40s. You know, they accumulated when I got my 30s and 40s. And that's a problem that, that is a, you know, in our military uh, is, is a, a really difficult problem. So I don't know if you have it in Australia, but in the United States, we actually have something called the Reserve Officer Training Program, um, where students, whether in college, also concurrently train to become officers in the military. And when they complete their college training, then they, they have an obligation to serve in the military. And the military pays, pays part or much of their educational cost to do that. So it's, it's a trade for people who don't have a lot of, a lot of money to go to university. Uh, and so uh, Jeff and his team, again with me as kind of the, uh, the old guy in the team observing, did this study where they recruited um, 15 students who were willing to go on the ketogenic diet and that's the blue here, and 15 who, were, who stayed on their usual diet. Um, and the ones who stayed in their usual diet continued to eat their, their get their regular food from the, the university cafeterias and, and coffee shops and things like that. The ones on the ketogenic diet got about half their food from the usual sources, but the other half to give them things that are uh, tasty, crunchy, and still low carb, they, they sourced that from the, uh, the, the research group. Uh, and so they, the goal was to get these kids living in, at a college, they were the young adults in college, uh, to follow a ketogenic diet. And then they did studies on body composition, physical and cognitive performance, muscle biopsies, et cetera. And then during this period of time, they were doing a standardized, very high intensity training, which included both resistance and endurance training. Uh, so this was done during a high intensity training phase of, of this ROTC program. Uh, this is basically shows the Ohio State University campus, you know, the stadium in the background here and all these, these soldiers here. But what, what we'll point out here is that if you look at the characteristics of these true groups, they were quite well matched, with the exception that if you look at the weight here and BMI, BMI is a measure, a crude measure of, of relative weight, that the group who chose, again, it wasn't randomized, they chose, but they, their BMI units are about three greater, so this is mid overweight, whereas this is the threshold of being heavy. But otherwise, they were quite well matched as groups, and they had 14 finished the mixed diet group and 15 finished the ketogenic diet group. The first question is, can, could these kids living on a campus where there's pizza and beer and candy machines and uh, soda and so on, and their average ketones during this period of time was 1.2 millimolar, whereas 0.5 is the threshold of being in nutritional ketosis. And they reported these values for 97% of, of the days, which means they didn't just measure them on Thursday after having you know, eaten lots of carbs for, on Sunday and Monday, and then they got really, really faithful for three days. They measured almost every day. This is a very consistent adherence to this diet, which is a remarkable performance for you know, this demographic of students. And what happened, first thing is they were eating the diet. This wasn't calorie restricted. They were eating the diet to satiety. We told them, eat enough that you feel adequately fed. And yet, on average, the ketogenic diet group lost 7.7 .7 kilograms. The control group lost, or maybe that's a gain, I'm not sure, 0.1. So dramatic difference in weight change to people eating to satiety. Almost all of that weight loss, 5.9 kilograms of the 7.7, .7, came from measured body fat by this tool called dual x-ray absorptiometry, which is very accurate. And 44% of that fat loss came from in the middle here, which is the most dangerous fat we carry. Um, so market changes in body composition. And in terms of performance, the ketogenic diet group had a 
20% uh, increase in lower body strength, seven or 9% increase in upper body strength, their performance in sprint, which is a measure of power to weight ratio, improved by 10%. Their peak aerobic power went up by 7%. They completed the obstacle course in 6% shorter. I mean, all of these parameters indicate that they didn't just lose weight. They maintained or improved their physical performance while losing body weight, which is nothing short of heresy. Uh, the fascinating thing is that when they measured their glycogen, remember this is a three-month study, it was down 14%. Whereas in my bike racer study in four weeks, it was down 47%. And the faster individuals who've been on this diet for an average of 20 months, it was the, the glycogen was only down 2%, which means that this is an adaptation curve. This takes a long time to get to. So this is not something you do short term, two weeks before the Olympics. This is something you start two years if you're going to use this as a tool to improve power to weight ratio. But it also indicates that a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, given adequate time to ad adapt, and meeting the requirements of getting enough minerals, which are critical, because, and again, we didn't deprive these, these weren't doing the Stefanson diet. These people were eating salads and, and vegetables and such because we're not sure how those Inuit women figured out how to make the diet work for their, their people. We didn't have all their learnings. But the advantages to athletes are the body fuel tank is 10 times bigger, at least 10 times bigger, when you're burning fat rather than when you're burning carbohydrate. It's, uh, in some organs, more efficient source of fuel than carbohydrates. You don't have to eat during exercise. Um, and then there are some things that we'll, we'll talk about in the next, next talk about the oxidative stress and inflammation, which are marked decreased when people are keto adapted. And these, by the way, are linked to longevity. Uh, athletes tell us that it improves their recovery, so they do a hard workout. They don't have to wait three days to do another workout. They feel well enough to do another hard workout one or two days later. Um, you don't want to hit the wall, which... Yeah, we, we bike, bicycle uh, uh, riders call bonking and runners call hitting the wall, but running out of carbohydrates is, a, is something you don't have to worry about when you're not burning them as your primary fuel. Uh, and then one of the things that athletes have noticed is as they're aging and they're running into problems of increasing body fat, when they get on the ketogenic diet, they can extend their, their performance careers and their, their productive careers as, as, as professional athletes, sometimes for two to four years longer, even though they come to this late in their career. So it's not something you have to follow for your life. It's something you can pick up and, and turn back the clock at least a number of years. Anyway, that's it. Thanks for your attention. And shall we?